Welcome to the very last class of Roots Tech 2023. If you're here with me in person, let's hear a big like whoop and holler. Yes! Thank you, and if you're here at home, go ahead and whoop and holler, but don't scare the dog, because that's what always happens to me. He's like laying all nice and quiet in my office, and then something wonderful happens. He's like, what? What was that? So don't scare the dog. I am Diane Southerd. I am founder and CEO of Your DNA Guide. We are a DNA education company here to help you make use of that DNA test result that's just been sitting on your computer for months or years and turn it into something that can help you make family history discoveries. So today we are talking about the shared matches tool, which is the only DNA tool you will ever need. Now, I know some of you are unbelievers in that statement. Because, oh, I hear you. Yes, girl, she believes me. And I hope to make all of you believers by the end of this hour. So that's the goal. I want to set some expectations about what's going to happen here. So there will be too much information shared in this hour. It's just the nature of spending an hour together listening to me talk because it will just be too much and you've already had three days of excellent instruction, so your brain is probably already pretty full. But that's okay. I want you to set the expectation that you are going to take one homework assignment away from today. And you are going to complete that homework assignment within the next 24 hours. Can I have a commitment? Okay, because it doesn't help you to sit here and learn something fabulous and then not go home and use it, because if you don't use it, you lose it. All right? So that's our commitment. And when you start to feel like this, I want you to say, it's okay. She said I was going to start feeling like this, and I'm all right, because I already know my homework assignment. I'm going to do this one thing. And then just, you know, enjoy the show, maybe take a little mini nap, wake up, it'll be fine. Okay, but I don't expect you to learn or comprehend every single thing I'm saying, because this is a, a advanced beginner to intermediate class. Okay, I hope that it's accessible to every single one of you, but again, it's going to be too much. So, let me start with this statement. You can find the ancestor that you are looking for using your DNA and one tool that's available at every DNA testing company. That is a bold statement that I'm going to stand behind and hopefully convince all of you of by the end of this hour. Now, let me tell you a story. This story is about a woman named Kristen, and she was in my DNA skills workshop. She was looking for a relative that was a slave. She was trying to document him, she was trying to find his connections. And using the tools that she learned in the workshop, primarily, guess what, the shared matches tool, she was able to find a descendant of her two times great-grandfather's brother. These brothers were both slaves. They were sold to separate states and there is no way that they could have found each other except using DNA testing. And she did it. But she didn't use any fancy tools. She used the shared matches tool and made that incredible discovery for her family. So the shared matches tool fits nicely into what I call your DNA guide, the plan. This is the plan. Now, it looks kind of complicated, and the good news is you don't need to master every single step for the plan to start working for you. Today, we are going to talk about the ways that the shared matches tool fits into this plan. There are three key places that we use the shared matches tool within the plan, and I'm going to take you through those specific locations. So let's start by first understanding what is the shared matches tool, what is it actually doing? So this is you, and you have two sets of chromosomes, one you got from your mom and one you got from your dad. So this is chromosome 11 and chromosome 12, one copy from each parent. 
But when we start trying to track two different chromosomes at the same time, it gets really confusing. So we're going to collapse it just down into one. When the shared matches tool is employed, what happens is you and your match, somebody else who's taken a DNA test, are going to share a piece of DNA, which means that piece of DNA has been found on the same chromosome location right here, just like this, on this little piece of chromosome 11. Guess what? It does not matter that this piece of DNA is on chromosome 11. Now, this is my soapbox. I have just stood up on it. This soapbox, I love to declare that you don't need any kind of segment tracking in your genetic genealogy research. Now, to avoid the passion that comes from being on my soapbox, I'm not going to stand there all day and preach about this. I have this opinion, and other experts in this field have a different opinion, and that's OK. My number one job today is to tell you that if you are not interested in learning all the cool science stuff involved in tracking chromosomes, you don't have to. This talk is not entitled chromosome tracking, segment tracking, the only tool you'll ever need. It's called the shared matches tool, the only tool you will ever need. So don't worry about which chromosome it's on. All that matters is that when you use this shared matches tool with one other person, what happens is you get a list of other people. Those other people are your shared matches. They are related to you in a similar way that this initial match is related to you. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter what chromosome they're on. It matters that the shared matches tool is a filter. Do you see how I made it a filter icon in my image? That's all you're doing. You're taking your big, huge, share, your huge match list at your DNA testing company, and you're whittling it down into just a small group of matches that matter. They matter for your research goal. So when these people share DNA with you, they do not share DNA on this same exact segment. That's not how this works. In fact, these people all share DNA with you on their own segment, and they share with your match on a totally different segment. That is statistically, biologically, the way it most often happens. But guess what? It doesn't matter. Did you hear her up here? She's, all, she's got this. <laughs> Somebody's asking, well, which chromosome do you match on? What are your start and end points? How many SNPs is that? Guys, it, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're sharing DNA with each other. That's all the information that you need to find the matches you need to make the breakthrough that will take down that brick wall. That's it. Shared matches tool. So what does it even mean? What does it mean when you share a match? It means that you share an ancestor, ideally. Okay, it doesn't always mean that, but most of the time, that list of individuals that you see on that shared matches list will share an ancestor with you and with the other people on the list. But there is another reason why people show up on that shared matches list, and it's really important to keep in mind. So if we're looking at a family tree, again, the first reason that you might share DNA with people on that shared matches list is that you all share a common ancestor. So we take this orange line up to our common ancestor, it comes down, and people on our shared matches list are other descendants of this common ancestor. That's ideal. That's what we want to happen, and that's what's happening most of the time. But sometimes there are people in the shared matches list who are related to you in one way through this green ancestor, but they're related to your match in a completely different way through a totally different ancestor. So 
it's so important that we remember all the shared matches tool really says is you all share some DNA. It does not guarantee a single recent common ancestor. Okay, so be careful. We use this tool as if we're all related always, but that's not the case. So how do you tell the difference? How do you tell if the people on the list share an ancestor or if we're just kind of all related in these various ways? Are you surprised that I'm gonna say that? You do genealogy! That's it, guys, there's no magic answer. You do genealogy. And as you're doing the genealogy with the people on the shared matches list, if you find that common ancestor, then you share a common ancestor. If you can't find the common ancestor and you're beating your head against the wall, how come I can't figure this out? Guys, it might be that they're related to you in one way and related to your match in a totally separate way. And that's okay. So, using the shared matches tool on a match gives you a shared matches list. So it's very important that you choose the right person to run the shared matches tool on. This person matters. This person, ideally, is what I call your best known match. This is actually the first step in the plan, is to find a best known match to run the shared matches tool on. Your best known match is someone you already know your relationship to. A lot of times we skip these people in our match list. We open up our DNA test results, we scroll down past all the people we already know, when those are the most important matches to start with. So let's take a look at this. Let's see if we can identify best known matches to help us investigate the ancestors we've got listed here. So you've got your ancestors, Abner and Alice, and you want to know who their parents are. So we need to find best known matches. Other people who are descendants of Abner and Alice, who we can use the shared matches tool on to help us find matches in our match list that relate to Abner and Alice. So as we look at this chart, these people in yellow are your best known matches. They are other descendants of Abner and Alice. Now importantly, Jack is not a best known match. Why? Because he's a descendant of your line. Your best known match is a descendant of the ancestor you want to research through a different line than yours. Okay? Starting with the best known match is the best way to begin your genetic genealogy research investigations. So, here we are. We found our best known match. The next step in the plan is to use that match to create a network of people. To do that, we use the shared matches tool. That's it. There's no other fancy way. You just take that best known match, run the shared matches tool, the resulting list of people is your network. So if this is our family tree, and this star with this couple, that's the couple we want to find. Whoever it is that you want to find should be your three times great grandparents or closer. Using this technology to find someone more distant than that just won't work very well, okay? Especially if you're just starting out. So you're looking for a three times great or closer, you're finding that person on your tree, and then we're going to engineer our research to find just the people in your match list that correspond to this particular branch. So it starts with a best known match. Let's start with a first cousin 
on our dad's side. Using the shared matches tool on a first cousin on our dad's side is going to help us see all the matches or a lot of the matches, not all, you'd need multiple first cousins, which you should do. But one will do a pretty good job of showing you the matches that are related on your dad's side. So we are eliminating those matches from our search. We don't need them right now. Next, we're going to choose a second cousin best known match who's related on our direct maternal line. Using shared matches on that match will pull out of the match list just matches that are related to that direct maternal line. Next up, we use a third cousin who's a descendant of this ancestral couple that you can see. Using, guess what? Shared matches. Shared matches, shared matches yes. Using shared matches on this third cousin best known match will pull out of our match list all the matches that are related to this line. Then what do we have left over? Just the matches that relate to this one branch of our family tree, the very branch we are trying to investigate. This is where we're headed. Once you have this group of matches that corresponds to this specific branch in your tree, your job is, hold on, to figure out how they're related to each other. So all those leftover matches, I call your best mystery matches. If you can figure out how your best mystery matches are related to each other, you then know that you are somehow related to them through that same ancestral line. Remember, you don't know what name you're looking for. Sometimes people go all the way to this step. They get to the best known matches. They have their leftovers. And then they're looking through trees, looking for names they know. Guys, if you knew his name, he wouldn't be a brick wall, right? So you have to look at the trees of your matches to find out who they have in common with each other. That's the ancestral couple that's likely related to you in some way. And then guess what? You get to do genealogy. Isn't that great? Because we love to do genealogy. So in order to keep track of all of these matches, you'll need to use some kind of match labeling system. There's a match labeling system available at Ancestry and at MyHeritage. And if you're a family tree DNA or 23andMe, you can use a system called the leads method to help you kind of organize things. I am going to go through with you how to do it just using Ancestry's tools. But if you go to our YouTube channel, which is your DNA guide, or it's YouTube slash your DNA guide, I have videos about these other methods too that you can watch. So the first tip is that there's no right way to use the dot system. There's a lot of methodologies out there, but I humbly present to you what I think is the best way, the best way to use the dot system. Oh, I forgot to tell you, hold on. So Peggy Chapman was a graduate of our DNA skills workshop, and at the beginning of my workshop, I kind of tell people, guys, we're gonna redo the dot system, so I need you to go in and delete all your dots, and she was like, oh. Never, right? Because you've spent so much time making these, you're like, it's not gonna happen. And so she fought it, and she didn't delete her dots at the beginning of class like I told her to. And she fought it for like weeks. The, the course is six weeks long, so I think for the first like three weeks, she was like, nope, I'm just gonna power through, use my own system, and then she's like, forget it. She deleted all of her dots, she started over, and then she says, I'm now a reformed daughter. I love the idea of dotting for a specific question. And that's what this is all about. You're dotting to answer a specific question. So it starts by understanding that each of your ancestral couples gets a color. So much of our genealogy research has been based on surnames. And we organize everything by a surname. Guys, in DNA, it always takes two, so far. Okay, it's always two people, okay? So we think of everything in terms of the couple, 
that created the next generation. So every ancestral couple gets a color. Next, you name all of those colors with the two surnames of the couple that are represented. If you don't know both people, that I usually just put the name of the one person you know. But each ancestral couple gets a color and you name that dot with the names of that couple. Next, you're going to go find your best known matches. The easiest way to do this is in through lines. Now, before you revolt, I know that through lines isn't always correct, but it is a good, I call it a cheat, right? It's cheating. It's a computer telling you stuff. It's not always right. So use your brain, but a lot of the times it's a great way to find those best known matches, which are, again, remember, people who are descendants of the ancestor you want to research through a different line than your own. So you go to through lines. I'm going to click on Thomas Hazelwood. I'm going to look for a descendant. I found one. There's MJ down there at the bottom. I'm going to click on MJ. And I'm going to add MJ to the appropriate group. So at Ancestry, it just says add to group. You click on that little button. It pops up. And you can add MJ to the appropriate Hazelwood Dance group. So Hazelwood Dance is the name of the couple that MJ and I are both descended from. And then MJ, my best known match, I will use the shared matches tool on him. This will allow me to gather out of my match list other people who are related to the Hazelwood Dance line. Now, if you'd like to know more about using the dot system as a filter and not a file, I'm giving a free webinar this month on the 22nd, 23rd. On the 23rd, you can go to yourdnaguide.com slash webinar if you'd like to sign up for that free webinar. And we're going to talk about that dot system and the match labeling in a lot more detail. So if that's something that you're interested in, I hope that you will join me in a couple of weeks at that webinar. Mm -hmm. You can take a picture of the slide if you want to. I'll wait just one second. <laughs> but you can also go back and watch this recording, remember, before the 23rd if you want to. <laughs> See, it's so nice people at home, you're just like screenshot. Psh, super easy. Here you got to get out your phone and like get it in focus. Okay. Great. Excellent. So remember, this is where we work. In the plan, we are using the shared matches tool on a best known match. That's creating for us a network of people. That's the first and most often used way that we employ that shared matches tool in our genetic genealogy research. But sometimes you'll need to split that big network that you created. So you will need to use the shared matches tool again. Now, I'm going to go through this whole splitting process, but this is the part where it's going to get just a little bit much, maybe. Okay? So if you're feeling like, I think I understood all the stuff she just said about shared matches on a best known match, putting the dots on, that's your homework. Your homework is to find yourself a best known match, use the shared matches tool, and give everybody on the shared matches list a dot. I didn't really emphasize that. I'm emphasizing it now. You use shared matches on a best known match, every single person on the list gets a dot. I don't care if you don't know who they are. I don't care if they don't have a family tree. I don't care if you think they're related to you in a different way, they get a dot every time. Because the dot is not a filing system to help you file away their information. It's a filter. Every match gets a dot. So let's talk about splitting networks. So splitting networks is a need that you have. A lot of times we just can't find that best known match, right? They're not everywhere. Not all of our cousins have taken DNA tests and not all of us have cousins to take the DNA tests. So sometimes you need to find those matches in a different way. So it helps to start thinking about your entire match list in terms of how many groups 
you can break your match list up into. I like to think of breaking up my DNA match list into these four groups. So ideally, you should be able to take your entire match list at any company and break it up into four groups to represent your four great-grandparent couples. Now, ideally, again, you have a best-known match that can help you do this. And maybe you find that best-known match in through lines. But if you don't, because through lines only works if somebody's posted their tree. We know not everybody posts their tree. So another way to find those best-known matches is to understand how much DNA does a second cousin share with you. Well, according to the Shared Santa Morgan Project, a second cousin is going to share between 500 and 150 centimorgans. So Santa Morgan, just a unit of measure for DNA. So you can actually go to your match list and you can kind of break it up according to these numbers. And when you do that, if you have that kind of top section of second cousins, you should be able to find four groups within that section. She's like, <laughs> yeah, right. Sure, Diane. Okay, I said should, okay? It's not gonna happen every time for everybody, again, because I don't know how many second cousins you've had tested, but the principle is the same for all of us. The principle is there should be four groups within that second cousin range of shared DNA. Those four groups, again, correspond to these four great-grandparent couples. So using the shared matches tool on a best-known match for each of these couples would theoretically lead you to these four groups of people. Okay? So let's see how this might play out. Let's say we have a best-known match from the Kepper-Young family. So we use the shared matches tool and mark with an orange dot all of the people who are from that Kepper Young family. So looking at our entire match list, maybe this is how it would be. Some of them are going to be Kepper Young, but most of them won't be, right? So remember, every time you use the shared matches tool, I want you to ask yourself, who did I just gather? If you used the shared matches tool on a Kepper Young best known match, you have just gathered descendants of Kepper Young, your second cousins or closer. You have gathered descendants of the Kepper family, descendants of the Young family on back, right? You've gathered people from this whole branch. They're all here in this shared matches network, essentially. So, these Kepper Youngs are your great-grandparents. You've got your two times greats in this bunch. You've got your three times greats in this bunch. What if you didn't know this line? This was your target. These were your missing ancestors. That means we now need to go into this Kepper Young network, this big group, and we want to find just this branch, just the target. How do we do that? Well, ideally, again, if we're looking at this big list of matches, we have our Kepper Young shared matches. We're just gonna pull them out into their own little group here. And again, I want you to think about who is present at each section of your match list. You've got your second cousins, you've got your third cousins, you've got your fourth cousins, Who's there? You've got some target and you've got some known in each of these cousin categories. So if we start, again, by thinking of who we gathered, people in the second cousin category are descendants of this Kepper Young. People in the third cousin category are descendants of Kepper Wilson and our target, who we don't know. Descendants of this fourth cousin place are descendants of this Kepper and someone and Wilson and someone and our two target ancestors. Okay, I know this kind of sounds like 
What is she even saying? Okay? But I need you to start thinking about who's in these groups. Who have you gathered when you use the shared matches tool? Who's there? And how can I get them out? How can I split this network so that I'm just left over with the target group? Okay, so the more you understand about who you've gathered, the easier it's going to be for you to figure out how to get at the people that you want. Okay, so again, we've created a big network and we want to split it. That's the next step in the plan. Split this big network into a smaller network that's going to help us find the people that we need. So big network we're calling Kepper Young. We want to split the network into Kepper Wilson, that we know, and target group, unknown. The best and easiest way to do that is to find a best known match who is Kepper Wilson. Now, if you don't have this person, you have to employ a strategy I call bottoms up. Okay, and I teach that in my book, and I teach that in my skills course. I'm not teaching that today. I'm sorry, we don't have like three hours together. Okay, but it can be done. So if you're feeling like, I don't have all these best known matches, it can be done to split your network without them, but it's harder. Okay, so I'm going to go with the assumption that a lot of you, again, you don't know, know these people. I call them best known matches. It's not like you guys call each other every day. That's not the kind of known I'm talking about. Okay, it's just that you know them because they have a tree and you can see how they connect to you. Okay, so hopefully you have a Kepper Wilson known match. Okay, so you use that Kepper Wilson known match. You use the shared matches tool and you dot those matches yellow. Now you have yellow dotted Kepper Wilson matches and you have leftovers. Do you feel the magic of that moment, you guys? It feels magical when you do it. When you go through Kepper Wilson and you make all those yellow dots and then you come back to your main match page, what you will see are people who just have an orange dot and don't have orange yellow. People with just the orange dot are your leftovers. They're your target group. They are the people that are holding the answer to your brick wall. And they are there right now in your match list. You just haven't found them yet. They're, they're waiting for you to make this discovery by just following this very simple, straightforward process of using the shared matches tool over and over and over again until you get to this point. Okay? So, if we have Kepper Young and we have Kepper Wilson all labeled, those leftovers are the matches that are going to give us the answer that we need. So this is a process. You start with the best known match. You use shared matches to make that network. If you need to, you use shared matches on other best known matches to split your network. Once you do that, you get leftovers which create your best known matches. I'm sorry, your best mystery matches, okay? So those are the first two ways that you use the shared matches tool to create your initial network and to split your network later. There's a third way that you use the shared matches tool, and that is to do genealogy. That's always the last step, by the way, to do genealogy. And to do genealogy, you need matches with trees. But we know not all of our matches have trees. But if you can figure out how your matches are related to each other, only one of them has to have a tree. One of the best ways to do that is at MyHeritage. At MyHeritage and at 23andMe, you can see the way that a match shares with each other. So this is the shared matches page at MyHeritage. 
my relationship to the match is going to be there on the left, and my match's relationship to the shared match is on the right. Okay? They have this filter. My heritage just has awesome filters, okay, all throughout their site. They're really fabulous to use. I'm going to sort this shared matches list by people's relationship to my match. Okay, so if I have this match who doesn't have a tree, but I want to know who they are, I might come to my heritage, I will sort the shared matches list by their relationship to this match that I'm curious about, and lo and behold, their mother or daughter, one or the other, has taken a DNA test. If that person has a tree, then I can probably figure out who this mystery match is according to that tree. So the shared matches tool at MyHeritage is a really fantastic way to find a tree, actually, for your match. Or at least find an approximation of the tree. So that's the third way that you use the shared matches tool to help you find the best mystery matches within your DNA match list that are going to help you answer your question. So one, create that network. Two, split that network. Three, use that shared matches tool to do genealogy. Okay, but that's not it, that's not it. The shared matches tool can do even more. It has superpowers. Okay, the superpowers of the shared matches tool are to first help us identify international ancestors. Second, spot discrepancies in our family trees. And third, they can reveal endogamy. So let's go through these. First of all, when you use the shared matches tool, if you have like two shared matches with another match, there's a really good chance that the ancestor you have in common with these three people was not born in the United States. So, so far, most of our DNA matches are people from the US. Now that's changing for sure, but in general, that is still the case. So I know almost immediately if I'm looking for an international ancestor, as soon as I use the shared matches tool on a match and I get at this super small match list. Almost always that means this ancestor is either a recent immigrant into the United States or that ancestor is actually born and lives outside the US. So if you have no idea who you're looking for, no idea where this ancestor came from, and you have a very small shared matches list, it's time to look international. Okay, so that's the first superpower of the shared matches tool. The second is that it can spot discrepancies in your family tree. So, let's say you use the shared matches tool on your first cousin, a best known match. You should gather, and you do gather, everyone who's related to you both, which is your entire paternal side of your family. You start looking through those shared matches, and you see lots of matches to your Franklin Owens line, lots. But you don't see any matches to the Martin Price line. And in fact, you know some of your Martin Price cousins have taken a DNA test, and they are not showing up on this shared matches list. What that means is Martin Price, that couple, is not the ancestral couple of your grandfather. Discrepancy. That's a nice way to say it, right? <laughs> Genetics does not match genealogy. That's really what we're saying. The thing is, People say, well, I don't have any matches to that branch of my tree. When what you really mean is I have matches, they're just leftovers. They're matches that don't match other lines. You have matches that map to this line, and finding them and diving into them will lead you to the identity of this missing person. So if you're using the shared matches tool on your best known matches, and it's not gathering the people that it should be gathering, there's a disconnect. 
between your genetic relationships and your genealogy relationships? The great news is the answer is still in the shared matches list. It's still there. It's just not the answer you expected. Okay, so spot discrepancies in your family tree using the shared matches tool. Last, you can see if you have endogamy. So endogamy is the process of marrying within the same clan or culture over and over and over and over and over again. So some good examples of endogamous populations are Jewish populations, Acadian populations, French Canadian populations, anyone who lives in small town America, you could have some endogamy in your family tree. So when you have endogamy, I want you to think of the pieces of DNA like pieces of licorice. Okay, now if I had this nice big piece of licorice and I had the same total amount of licorice just in smaller pieces, and I offered them to this five-year-old girl, which one would she choose every time? Yes, the big one. You're like, no, 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 it's fine. It's the same amount. It's the same amount as your brother. Look, it's the same total amount of licorice. He just has the bigger one. Is she gonna be okay with that? Never, right? Many a war has been fought over a broken granola bar, right? No, it's really, it's fine, it's back together. Look, it's fine, right? We've all done that, okay? So I want you to think about your pieces of DNA like these pieces of licorice. When you do not have endogamy in your family, nice big pieces of DNA get passed down through the generations from a common ancestor. So you and your cousin will share decent sized pieces of DNA that came from a common ancestor. When you have endogamy, the same total amount of DNA is shared with the person, but it's in much smaller pieces because those pieces did not come from a single recent common ancestor. They came from multiple more distant common ancestors. So how does this look on your match page? So if you have a match, Kendra, who's your mom's second cousin once removed, or she's a second cousin once removed on your mom's side, <coughs> you use shared matches, you're going to get a list of people. But if you and Kendra are from an endogamous population, this list of people isn't going to be nice and clean and clear cut and related to just one line. You are going to see people in that match list who are related on your mom's side and your dad's side. And it can be really confusing. Hold on, Diane said if I use shared matches, the list of people would be related to this one line. That should happen. When it doesn't happen, you know you have endogamy. And this is actually one of the best ways that people discover they have endogamy in their family tree because they didn't know. Because if you're not Jewish, I mean, you're not looking for it. But there's endogamy everywhere. Small town America has a lot of endogamy. Every island population has a ton of endogamy. And it makes this whole splitting network thing pretty much impossible. So, I mean, we teach a whole course about how to do a DNA research with endogamy, but my number one tip that will help all of you, even if you don't have endogamy, is to pay attention to that segment size. So here at Family Tree DNA, they make it really easy to see segment size. It gets its own column, which is why I like to show it. So if I'm in table view in my Family Tree DNA family finder results, I can look at this section called the longest block. That's going to tell you the biggest piece of DNA you have shared with this particular match. So these are results just from my dad, and we don't have endogamy in our family, but if you look at these matches, you can see these two people have about the same total amount of shared DNA, 136 centimorgans versus 127 centimorgans. So again, it's about the same amount. We have about the same genetic relationship according to that total amount of shared DNA. But that second column, that longest block, you can see that first match, the biggest piece is 50 centimorgans. And the second one is only 24, half as big. So I know that you have limited research hours in your life. 
If you are going to spend time trying to figure out how you're related to someone, choose the guy with the 50 centimorgan segment, not the guy with the 24. You might still be related to the guy with the 24, sure. But you're going to have better luck because you can be very confident that you're connected to the guy at 50 centimorgans. Now we're working on this. We're trying to get some better data about centimorgan size and relationships. And there is some data coming out and it's fun to look at. And I think in general we can say that if the biggest piece of DNA you share with someone is over 40 centimorgans, you are third cousins or closer. So that's a pretty good like line in the sand, isn't it? It's pretty neat to be able to look at your DNA match and even if you don't know who you're, how you're related, that you can be confident that you're connected as a third cousin or closer. That's a very researchable kind of relationship. So it's vital to do this if you have endogamy. But for the rest of us, it's also really helpful and helps, again, narrow your focus so you're only looking at your best mystery matches and not wasting your time with other matches that are going to be more difficult to place in your tree. Okay, so the superpowers of the shared matches tool are to help identify international ancestors, spot discrepancies in your family tree, and to reveal endogamy. So here it is, your DNA guide, the plan, and the three ways that you're going to use the shared matches tool to help you execute the plan. The first, of course, is to create an actual network. The second is to help you split that network. And the third is to do the genealogy. And of course, as a bonus, you can figure out if you have international ancestors, decide if there's a discrepancy, and identify endogamy. So we have some time for questions. Let me go through four slides, and then I will take any questions that we have before you guys go home and do your homework. Okay, remember, your homework, your homework is to find a best known match, use the shared matches tool, and practice that dotting system that I taught you. Every couple gets a color, every couple is labeled with their names. Create the big network, then use another best known match to split that network so you have this nice group of leftovers and then dive into those people. We didn't get to that in the plan, how to dive in, but really you're just looking at each match and trying to figure out how are these matches related to each other? Who is their common ancestor? And the first time you see it, so you look at one match, you look through the tree, maybe it's a small tree they have, and you're like, okay. You open up the next match and you're looking, what? They have a Martin, they have a Martin, oh my goodness, these Martins are connected. And then it's, it's seriously the best feeling in genealogy. It's that moment of discovery. And it's waiting for you. All you have to do is follow the plan. Okay, so don't forget to rate this section. Roots Tech really, really appreciates all of your feedback. But I know you're very busy and it's the end of the day. And so I've just given you the answers. It's really easy, just all fives. I don't want you to have to think too much. I want you to do your homework and have time for that, okay? Also, we have had a booth in the exhibit hall and it's been so fun to meet and talk to so many of you. And our online audience, we appreciate you. We've heard your comments on social and we've, we've seen you out there watching us. Thank you for joining us virtually here at Roots Tech. But the exhibit hall is closed right now, but we still had a few of our books left, and I'd just rather not take them home. So we got some permission to um, just sell them there in the back of the room. So Kathy and Sunny are back there. If you'd like to get a copy of the book that will teach you the plan, they are back here in the corner. Um, it's, it's important that you know that learning this is an iterative process. And sitting in a class for 45 minutes is not going to do it. You've got to practice this. Go home and try it. Try it out. If you get stuck, go to my YouTube channel, go to my blog, and search for what you're looking for. We've put a lot of resources out there to try to help you. But you're going to get stuck. 
and that's okay. Watch our webinars, come to our classes, that's what we're here for, is to help you. So thank you for coming. I, I'm not gonna be offended if you don't wanna stay, it's been a long week, okay? But I, I do have time to answer questions if anybody wants to ask them. So please, thank you. Okay, so his question is, when I was going through that first initial, how to make your networks, and I used a first cousin to split off my dad's side, then I used a second cousin on a different line to split off that direct maternal line, then I used a third cousin on yet another line to get rid of those ancestors. So it's different cousins on different lines, but to be the most effective, I would use four first cousins and seven third cousins. Like the more cousins you can use that are related to that line, the better you're going to be at actually getting rid of everyone. Yeah. Yes. So how far back can you use this process? I'm looking, I've got a roadblock at about eight generations. Can you still use this? So she says, how far back can you use this process? Her brick wall is at eight generations back. You can use this process to find a three times great or closer. If you're farther back than that, you need Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA. Then that's what you use, and that's, that's just the limitation of autosomal DNA. It just can't go back that far because you just don't have enough DNA from those ancestors to help us do it. But Y DNA can still be very effective, especially um, if you've already done the test. Yeah, so use that. Yes, ma'am. So she said about international ancestors, how recent would they be if we don't have very many matches? Usually it's really recent. Um, by the time, you know, if you think about a person, right, they immigrate, they get married, they have four kids, and then those kids have four kids, right? By the third generation, you've got some descendants, and they're probably have tested and shown up on your match list. But if they're really recent, all of their family is back in the home country where they're not testing. So it's not an exact science, right? If you don't have that many shared matches, it doesn't automatically mean that they're international, but it is a really good indication. So maybe that the grandparents immigrated or that the parents? Yeah, so take my, so my grandma, for example, she's first generation American, okay? Versus my dad's side who's been in America forever. Right, you look at my grandma's match list, just total matches in general, way lower. Because her dad was born in Wales and her mom in Italy, and they don't have family here, right? Versus my dad, and there's just a billion of them. Right, so it's, it's obvious to me because it, I can see the difference between the two. That's yeah. yeah, okay, yes? Okay, so she's asking about the Y and the mitochondrial. So if you want to find an ancestor that is further back than a three times great, you have to use Y or mitochondrial. So Y DNA traces only a direct male line, all the way up like the top of your family tree, right? Only men can take that test. But it's, it's so stable, Y DNA doesn't change that much every generation. So a man who tests his Y DNA today will have the same or very similar Y DNA to his eight times great grandfather. It's just so stable. Mitochondrial DNA, which we all have and traces that direct maternal line, is even more stable. You have the same mitochondrial DNA probably as your 15th great grandmother. So it's just so much more stable, so it's easier to trace for a longer period of time. Yes, sir. I come from an endogenous population. I have several matches that are like large as segments, 50 centimorgans, but they're totally 60. What do you think of that? Keep them in the mix? Yeah, so he says he, he comes from an endogamous population. He has several matches who have a longest segment of 50. Total is 60. So remember, any match who has a longest segment over 40 is a third cousin or closer, and you should absolutely investigate them, for sure. Yes, ma'am.
Yay! She's redone her dots, everyone. She's very brave. <laughs> Right, so she has, she's, she deleted her dots, which is super brave, right? In that moment that you're like, they're like, are you sure? And you're like, <laughs> yes. Okay, it's worth it, okay? So she's redone her dots. She can see clear distinctions on her dad's side, but on her mom's side, everything seems kind of jumbled. And so a couple of things have, are possible. When you see jumbled dots, my first thought is going to be endogamy that maybe you didn't realize was in there. Second could be just multiple relationships, which is different than endogamy. So endogamy is marrying within the same family or culture after generation after generation. Multiple relationships could be a cousin marriage or something like that. That can also mess up your dots a little bit. Incest? Yes, right? Yes, if there is incest, that's also going to mess up with the amount of shared DNA that you have, the way that the dots work. So anytime you're not seeing clear distinctions, you know that there is another explanation. Endogamy, multiple relationships, sometimes it's incest, but sometimes it's also the people that you use to make the dots. Remember, who did we choose? We chose our best known matches. But what if you use through lines, which is a cheat, and you chose someone who you don't actually know, but you can see they're related to you, you use them to make your whole dot system, turns out they're not who they say they are, okay? That's gonna mess up your whole dot system because it's based on your best known match. So sometimes, before we you know, make other conclusions, I again recommend delete everything and do it over again with different best known matches just in case one of them is actually related to you in multiple ways, but you didn't know it, okay? So sometimes it's a, it's a user error, really, right? Because you made the dots. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm so glad I bought your book today. I'm excited to read it. Thank you. Um, and I got the Y37 okay. from Family Tree, but uh, should, do, you, do you recommend the big Y? And will this, can I still get break through the brick wall in my father's line using your tools. Okay, so his question is primarily, I think, he has a 37 marker Y-DNA test. He wants to know, is big Y worth it? Okay, so big Y is a very comprehensive Y-DNA test and it's worth it for two reasons. One, it's a better record of your family and we're all about record keeping. And two, it's better at helping you determine what I call your generation of connection. So with Y-DNA, when you match someone exactly, you could be brothers or you could be like 10th cousins, okay? But with the big Y, if you're still matching like exactly, which is kind of hard to do, honestly, even among very close family, then you're very closely related to each other. So big Y is meant to help related lines better figure out exactly how they're connected, okay? Your 37 marker test is gonna be pretty good at telling you, sure, you're related, or nope, we're probably not. That's it, it's not gonna tell you when. Big Y will be like, here's a group of related people, and here's a better idea of how we're connected to each other. Okay, that's probably all the time we have, otherwise they just cut me off and I'm like Bleh, and it looks really weird. So thank you for coming. I'll still be here if you have a question, please come up and ask.